Never reasonable to restrict constitutional freedoms in the name of fighting terrorism? Um, in our opinion, no. And now the plain truth. As you've seen on our show, the government at times tells you lies. The deception is historic and continuous. The government needs to be exposed because it cannot be trusted to expose itself. We live in exciting and fearful times. Most of you today are not afraid of big crime or big business or big labor. Rather, most of us are most afraid of big government. All right, folks, there is a lot going on right now. Decisions being made that are unprecedented and will have an overreaching impact on what it means to live in the United States of America. Who could want a government that punishes people for speech, that lets its own agents write their own search warrants, that fights wars just to keep the military-industrial complex busy, that debases all you own by printing worthless money and putting it into the stream of commerce, that gives away more than half the tax dollars it collects, and that despite express provisions in the Constitution to the contrary, permits the president to lock up whoever he wants and to throw away the key. The president saying he can secretly kill Americans and have bags put over our head and have us thrown into black vans to disappear forever. Or look at the TSA and the airports groping people. Look at the drones in our skies. Look at army checkpoints now, the end of uh, posse commentatus. We see the president signing legislation to charge people with felonies if they protest at national security events. You know, people ask, is this martial law? Yes, we've been under a soft form of martial law with secret arrest, warrantless spying, protesters getting beaten up, uh, all of these type of things going on for a long, long time. Now they're telling us torture is good, secret arrest of citizens is good, uh, the government taking over infrastructure is good. They don't deny all this stuff that we warn people about forever being real now. Ron Wyden and Mark Udall of Colorado, uh, two Democratic senators, came out uh, today and said, hey, you know what? Uh, we know things you don't because we're on an intelligence committee and uh, Americans would be, quote, stunned to find out how the American government is applying the Patriot Act. Documents just released indicate police departments across the country do track cell phones without bothering to get any permission from a court. After reviewing 5,500 pages of records, the ACLU says police agencies, large and small, often obtain cell phone data without court permission. If the government wants it, it needs a search warrant. If it gets it without a search warrant, it has committed a crime. A crime. Obtaining a warrant can slow down that process. Oh, and it's going to slow the process down if we have to ask for authorized, if they ask a judge, can we search authorized dollar cell phone records to find a missing person? Call me. A cell phone warrant, it usually took me about 15 minutes. Once you've written one, you've written all of them. You know, warrants are in our Constitution. You need to get a warrant before you search or seize anything. But apparently the Constitution no longer applies. The ACLU saying in the report this has become big business for service providers. The practice is so common that cell phone companies have manuals for police. If my cell phone company is going to give up my information, I think they need to send me a note in the mail, say, we gave your information to a third party, because they always tell you, we're not going to give your information to a third party. But they also found training manuals, like one from the Iowa City Police Department that says, in quotes, do not mention to the public or the media the use of cell phone technology or equipment used to locate the target subject. The manual also advises not to put this stuff into the police reports. So, doesn't that make you feel safe? Law enforcement is doing something that they know would probably cause public outrage and which they know raises legal questions. So their solution is not to stop doing it. No, of course not. Their solution is just to hide it from you. Unless they suspect me of a crime, the police do not need to follow me. That's why they need probable cause. And people say, what do you have to hide? I don't have anything to hide, but the police don't need to follow me if they have no reason to think that I'm in Al-Qaeda. And by the way, <laughs> I'm not in Al-Qaeda. You know, it's just another sign of our ever-expanding surveillance state. One that's being sold to the people as a buffer against terrorism. But the truth is, it's being used by law enforcement all the time to track people that have nothing to do with a terrorism-related investigation. It started with the FBI, and the government said, oh, we have to let the FBI do it because they're tracking terrorists. Now, it's no longer terrorists. It's every case, any conceivable case, and it's no longer terrorists, and it's no longer just the FBI. It's all the local police as well. So there you have it. That's how we destroy our Constitution right in front of our eyes. Uh, the ACLU's most recent info sheet uh, says that 1.7 billion, with a B, uh, emails, phone calls, and text messages are being intercepted and stored by the U.S. government. Now, the CIA, or the Central Intelligence Agency, prides itself on being the best spying machine in the world. 
But how much are new technologies that, you know, we're all growing to love, growing to depend on, making the job easier for them? Be it social networking, a variety of gadgets that we all use, use that are now connected to the internet, like your PlayStation, your smartphone, your GPS. Soon enough, even more devices inside your home. And then they had the Secretary of Defense, they had the CIA director in there, Petraeus, saying, oh, we're working with industry to have bugs and tracker systems built into all appliances. Your dishwasher is going to be listening to you. Watch what you say. We don't need warrants anymore. It's a really scary world of scary possibilities out there, and Congress is ready to counter it, with over 50 cybersecurity bills introduced just in this congressional session. But is this threat being overblown? Are we conflating different threats all into one gigantic apocalyptic scenario just to line the pockets of defense contractors and create a massive cybersecurity complex? So far, nobody in Congress has actually provided evidence that cybersecurity legislation of this nature really is, uh, you know, is needed. There are a lot of folks who stand to benefit uh, from comprehensive cybersecurity legislation, especially if that legislation comes attached with big spending. Well, if you thought that SOPA and PIPA were bad, just wait until you hear about cybersecurity legislation working its way through Congress. It's called CISPA, or the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protect Act, also known as H.R. 3523. Here, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Tech America, they're on board. How come? Well, it tells the Internet companies, look, our bad. We didn't mean to go after you guys, okay? You're giant corporations as well. We're totally happy with you guys. What we want to do is go after anyone that dares to cross the government, and we, go, we know you guys would never make that mistake. Now you might think, come on, are they really going to do that? Hell yes, they're going to do that. Let me give you a perfect example, WikiLeaks. If they have a law like this, they can just simply come in and tell the ISP provider, look at this law that we have, it's over, shut down WikiLeaks. But also, did you notice they snuck in private entity? So if you're a threat to a private entity, they might also shut you down. And under the veil of doing things for cybersecurity purposes, it would allow companies to collect and monitor private communications and then share them with the government or anybody else. A company like Google, Facebook, Twitter, or AT&T could intercept your emails and text messages, send copies to one another and to the government, and modify those communications or prevent them from reaching their destination if it fits into their plan to stop cybersecurity threats. So what it does is it essentially carves out a cybersecurity exception to all of our privacy laws. So in the end, if they pass this, instead of passing PIPA or SOPA, well, they might have the same effect in terms of shutting down our sites, and they also have the second effect of merging business and state even further together. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm a little pessimistic on this one. I said that we could win on SOPA. I accurately call that one. Why? Because we had huge corporations on our side. Facebook, Google, etc. Now we're on our own. And without those guys backing us up, good luck to us. Starting Thursday, July 12th, ISPs, Internet Service Providers, will be spying, not just on your bandwidth, right? but specifically on what you are downloading. You are giving them uh, an unfettered, unchecked right to cut off your service based upon the claims of copyright holders who have been shown time and time and time again to make false claims. And there's no recourse for you. Well, I think that online piracy is a red herring. Uh, these transnational content companies make more money than ever. Uh, look at how much money is made from legitimate music downloads via iTunes. Uh, they're making a fortune, literally, uh, billions of dollars every year in legal download revenue. And they're saying that they need to crack down on pirates, but really they want to crack down on internet communication itself. Talking Points member reports that Facebook has started to ask certain users to upload photos of their government-issued ID cards. That includes passports, driver's licenses, work or military IDs will also do. And these documents indicate that the Department of Homeland Security has been spying on us uh, on Facebook and they're looking for specific words. And some of the words that they're looking for in our profiles includes marijuana, right? So I'll give you an example of some of the, um, I guess, words that set the alarms for the Department of Homeland Security. Drill. All right, drill. Exercise. Airport. <laughs> Exercise, okay. Well, why don't you just go ahead and waste all of our time and our money going after that? Airport, drug, narcotics, cocaine, and marijuana. 
But once you create these things, they grow out of control. And Big Brother just keeps on rolling on. I mean, we live in a police state at this point. With the police enforcement spying on innocent people without absolutely no probable cause. This is just another example of that. Not only is your every move on Facebook now being posted for your friends to see, but Facebook might still be watching even after you log out. Sure, so over the last few decades, we've increasingly come to entrust third parties with our private data. All of these companies have been trusted by us, and they're collecting data about us in many cases and storing it you know, in the cloud or in, in some data center. And once the data leaves our possession, it's really up for grabs uh, for the government. A new AP investigation has revealed that the NYPD was spying on activists as far away as New Orleans. Now, if the NYPD is traveling down into Orleans to monitor a protest and tracking Muslims all over the Northeast, then one can only imagine how they're reacting to the Occupy movement. It's being called intelligent CCTV, surveillance cameras that can pick out suspicious behavior in a crowd and stop terrorists before they strike. Researchers in Reading are leading the world in developing the new technology. Researchers at Reading University think they've got the technology to spot the terrorists before they strike. First, there were eyes on the street, and now there are eyes in the skies. The director of national intelligence has given the go-ahead for the nation's spy satellites to be used regularly by U.S. civilian agencies and law enforcement. Now the Department of Homeland Security wants to monitor anybody who's leaving the United Kingdom, not just Americans. Now those who are traveling to Mexico are also going to be sharing personal details, especially if they're flying to Mexico City or to Cancun. And if any travelers are pondering a vacation in Cuba or the Caribbean, be prepared to give over your info, too. This is an excuse to collect everybody's information about the TSA. Uh, turns out they're not just doing these things in airports anymore. They're now doing them at ferries. They're doing them at, uh, at bus stations, on subways. So are you ready to just start having TSA everywhere that you go? Yeah. Oh, the part I found most interesting is that they've been working with ICE. So, you know, of you course, might, yes. you're, you're going to get your papers inspected while you're being fondled. Uh, we have a $2 billion data center being built out in the Utah desert to spy on American citizens. Um, it's NSA's newest and biggest surveillance program. It's called Total Information Awareness. The program targets all kinds of electronic information from around the world. So this includes emails, tweets, texts, phone conversations, you name it, from U.S. citizens. It's being called the biggest spy machine ever. Uh, you know it's just going to get bigger. They're just going to use these resources in new ways. To be specific, they showed the FBI taught its agents that they could sometimes, quote, bend or suspend the law in their hunt for terrorists and criminals. Uh, it outlaws certain forms of peaceful protest. If you happen to be within close proximity to high-ranking elected officials who are receiving Secret Service protection, that can be considered a felony. So if you can't protest in your own nation's capital, uh, what kind of constitutional republic have we become? The UK is going to start testing these lasers that temporarily blind individuals, especially if they're participating in protests or riots. Yeah, in other words, uh, if people start speaking up against the government, we're going to temporarily blind them. Uh, when you don't have the right to protest, you don't have much left. Just more proof that your freedom of speech really ain't all that free. In fact, it just might land you on a government list. It gives the military the power to indefinitely detain American citizens suspected, just suspected, not convicted, of some sort of involvement or affiliation with terrorism. It basically means the president, the administration, can just say, you're a terrorism suspect, the military takes you away, and we may never hear from you again. Obama had said he didn't want to sign it. Then it turned out he demanded that the provision for secret arrest of citizens and secret killing and torture be added. Is that this means that the military, not our civilian justice system, is going to be in charge. What's wrong with the court system that we already have? Nothing, actually, if you consider the fact that there have been more than 400 people in the last 10 years that have been prosecuted successfully in our federal courts for terrorism-related offenses. Military commissions, on the other hand, only six cases. This is part of the problem. The dangers of this overly expansive global war on terror is that anything can now be deemed a battlefield by the administration. ICE is responsible for holding 32,000 people in immigration detention without any charges on a single day. So why are so many of these immigrants actually ending up in jail? Well, you see, it all comes down to money. Private prisons make a killing off of undocumented immigrants because they can hold them in their prisons, allowing the detention centers to meet their financial goals. Private prisons make money off of incarceration. The more people they lock up and the longer they keep them, the more money they make. 
They're clearly making a business out of rounding people up. The profitability of private jails depends on the prison population continuing to go up. The rate of incarceration in the U.S. has quadrupled since the 80s. While public prisons are accountable to the public, private ones answer only to shareholders and are not subject to external scrutiny. That means many private contractors face few consequences for the poor or even inhumane treatment of detainees. All right, so let's get back to what I opened the show with. More war on terror that shows no signs of waning. We've got the Secretary of Defense telling 60 Minutes that they will not show any evidence and the public will just have to believe the administration when they label someone a terrorist and execute them without any due process. So, all that we can get from Panetta's answer here is that the evidence doesn't matter. Due process in a courtroom to prove that evidence doesn't matter. If the government calls you a terrorist, they can kill you and the rest of us are just supposed to take their word for it. The U.S. government now laying out its legal argument for killing American citizens overseas without a trial. But what about targeting people on U.S. soil? Does that only apply to U.S. citizen that's overseas, or does that apply to U.S. citizen that's here? As well? I'd have to go back. I, I, uh, I, I'm not certain whether that was addressed or not. So that you, we have clarity here. He is not certain whether it was addressed, whether our government can kill our own people inside our own country. Are you slightly uncomfortable with the idea that the United States president, whoever it may be, can decide that this or that U.S. citizen living abroad is a threat to national security and kill them? International war on terror that's going on now, we're going to have to make sure that we have the tools to get some of these people who are very bad and comply with American law. And you think that the president should be able to make that decision? in conjunction with the folks in the administration without going to a court without going to you all anything there, there is a war going on uh, there's no question about that he's the commander-in-chief and there's been guidelines set and if he follows those I think he should be able to do it it's just so I understand correctly are you really saying that in certain situations the president can decide whether it's in the best interest of the nation and then do something illegal I'm saying that when the president does it that means it's not illegal this federal government, this administration, says it can kill Americans when they're riding with their children in a car in a desert. That is quite a horrifying reality of how our government functions these days, of how completely out of hand this war on terror has become. So we can kill you anywhere, and we don't have to ask a, a, a damn soul about it. So Eric Holder said, okay, okay, you know what, we've been getting a lot of flack for that. I'm going to go to Northwestern, I'm going to clear this thing up. And uh, he did. He gave a speech uh, where he explained uh, that there are no rules. Some have argued that the president is required to get permission from a federal court before taking action against a United States citizen. This is simply not accurate. Due process and judicial process are not one and the same, particularly when it comes to national security. The Constitution guarantees due process. It does not guarantee judicial process. And now a new interpretation of the Constitution where due process is a bunch of guys in the executive branch getting together saying, should we kill somebody? Yeah, let's go ahead and kill them. But the thing that makes it critical here is that the U.S. government unilaterally, without any proof, without any due process at all, is actually pointing the finger and saying, you, my friend, are a terrorist. So the question then becomes, if they get to decide what makes you question whether or not they can't decide that it's you, or it's me, or it's my neighbor, or my father, or my son. The Constitution says to the contrary. The Constitution says if the government wants your life, or your liberty, or your property, it has to articulate to a jury what law you have violated and prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt to that jury. It's called due process. Without due process, the government could take anything it wanted and kill anybody it wanted. Well, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, along with the U.S. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Office, have placed a large and rather interesting order. They've ordered 450 million rounds of ammunition to be made and delivered to them over the next five years. All right, so this is interesting because this is not the Pentagon making the order for the military. It's DHS and ICE. And to give you a little perspective here, there are only about 311 million people living in the entire country. Uh, so it begs the question, why such a massive order, 450 million bullets? DHS, Department of Homeland Security, consists of uh, the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, and Immigration Services. This is a domestic law enforcement agency. And to be fair, uh, some people online who don't want to believe uh, what's going on have said that this is just going to be used for target practice or also uh, 
It could be that the government is simply stockpiling ammunition because uh, they don't want to get into a situation where there's an ammo shortage and our law enforcement officers don't have any ammunition. And those are both fair points, but uh, that kind of ammo that they purchased from ATK, hollow point ammunition, as you had explained, uh, it's designed to, you know, tear through human flesh and then expand. It's designed to kill people. This is not the optimal uh, kind of ammo you would buy for target practice. It's more expensive and it's more precise. But even if they're burning through 20 million rounds a month uh, to train their agents, this is still overkill. This is still too much. So best case scenario, this is sort of a waste of taxpayers' money. And worst case scenario is, as you said, they're planning for economic unrest or violent protests or something that requires hollow point ammunition on a wide scale. And uh, they actually placed, they have an open bid right now, DHS, for even more ammunition for 175 million rounds of uh, 223 caliber rifle ammo. Uh, we're rapidly militarizing our domestic law enforcement officers. And you know, I think a lot of people are scared. Uh, TSA is scary enough. Wait until they all have guns. Well, I mean, you can't speak back when they're, when they're groping you at the airport. Since 2001, the federal government has spent $34 billion on militarizing our local police enforcement. However, several police stations across the country have splurged on some pretty fancy equipment. The Bearcat 3. This is a nine-ton armored vehicle with bullet-resistant windows, gun ports, tear gas dispenser, loudspeaker, and a battering ram on the front bumper. Now, several departments, including the NYPD, are also using mobile watchtowers, giving cops an eye in the sky. Well, they took it one step further and used a DHS grant to get their own weaponized drone. That's right, this $300,000 Shadowhawk drone made by Vanguard Defense Industries weighs 50 pounds and can be equipped with a beanbag launcher and a taser, giving officers the ability to stop a target from the sky. Does the name Shadowhawk sound familiar? That's because they're the same brand that's used by the military in Afghanistan for counterterrorism operations. So why do cops need a tank or a drone? Well, they don't. But if they can get one, then they figure why not. Call me crazy, but these devices need to be left to the military for war situations, not to use against Americans for domestic purposes. And of course, if you throw the words national security or terrorism in there, everyone acts like it's no big deal. Even though they don't, these police departments don't need this equipment, they will still use it, and they'll use it for stupid things. Like, for instance, they'll go to raid, like they'll raid a party, for instance, right? Ooh, or that's a tank. <laughs> no, but this is happening throughout the country, right? Like, this is a police state, you know, our police enforcement is militarized, so they'll overreact to stupid situations. And to give all of these, these agents so much firepower, uh, it, it really does make you wonder if they know something that the American people do not know about. They're talking about inserting the army into domestic law enforcement. Senator Lindsey Graham, who supports this bill, says, quote, the homeland is part of the battlefield and people can be held without trial, whether an American citizen or not. The government may be uh, preparing for some sort of martial law. We shine the spotlight on an executive order that the White House was hoping that you would never learn about. Now, the president signed the National Defense Resources Preparedness Executive Order. It gives the president the power to control U.S. resources in times of war, and peace. Now this includes, but is not limited to, food and livestock, water, plants, energy, health resources, transportation, and construction materials, and gives the government the ability to, quote, control the general distribution of any material, including applicable services in the civilian market. This would give the President of the United States the authority to declare, basically, martial law during times of peace. So it's starting to sound more and more like we're getting closer to martial law by the day. Now, while you say that most Americans say that they don't care, they have nothing to hide, I think those Americans would care, might feel differently, if it turns out that what the police were doing is illegal. They're law enforcement, and yet many departments aren't even bothering to get warrants because they can get the technology on their own. And, you know, going through the court system, getting a warrant, all that stuff is just so tedious. If you're not breaking the law, if you're not doing anything wrong, then you shouldn't worry what the government is doing. Well, I think the average person out there thinks that this is only being used uh, to pursue uh, radical Islam and these terrorist groups, but they don't need a law like this to go after 150 or 200 people. This is being used on tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of Americans, where they just go on these fishing expeditions looking for stuff. And, you know, your viewers out there can say, uh, if I'm not doing anything wrong, I don't have anything to worry about. But we've always been told from a young age in school onward that if you're not doing anything wrong, uh, the government in America does not look through your emails. The government does not look through what you're doing. If it's the bad guys, it's those foreign terrorists, that it's okay. 
It's not like my government would ever do it to me. But guess what? You're wrong, because your government would totally do that to you, and now they'll be able to by law. Some of the things that make you suspicious of terrorism are having food, having more than seven days of food, missing fingers on your hand, having ammunition, having weatherproofed ammunition, having several guns at your house. That's right. People who pay for small purchases in cash, like coffee or gum, apparently that's a big red flag. Big time. So you should be careful of those that are overly concerned about their privacy. And that is the exact language in the FBI pamphlet. And attempting to shield your computer screen from other patrons, well, that's a sure sign that you're suspicious. We're talking about someone suspected of activities. All right, so despite the fact that there's no relation to any terrorist activity or investigation, the government has decided that they want to keep all that data that they have about you anyway, because you never know when you're going to need it somewhere down the line. But as much as we all want the country to be safe, want the authorities to be on top of it, are we really willing to have the government consider each and every one of us a terrorist? You see, that's essentially what's happening. If you look at the language within the guidelines of the NCTC and what it's meant for, it's supposed to receive intelligence exclusively pertaining to domestic terrorism. Counterterrorism officials are now allowed to keep tabs on anyone for up to five years, even if they have no ties to terror. Are you willing to sacrifice your freedom for liberty? We have let Roosevelt's fear of fear itself overtake us. We have listened to the little voice inside that has said, this will be temporary, this will be precise, this too shall pass. We have accepted that the only way to stop the terrorists is to let the government become just a little bit like the terrorists. But the problem is most people don't know, and those who do know don't necessarily care. Goodness gracious, indefinite, preemptive, or endless detention surely doesn't apply to U.S. citizens unless current or future president says so. Don't you worry a bit. And if you somehow think habeas corpus has not been suspended for American citizens, but only for everybody else, ask yourself this. If you are pulled off the street tomorrow and they call you an alien, or an undocumented immigrant, or an unlawful enemy combatant, exactly how are you going to convince them to give you a court hearing to prove you are not? Do you think this attorney general is going to help you? And I think that if the average person knew about this, they would be quite upset. Uh, I think the average person just doesn't know, to be honest. And I hope that they do find out about these grotesque abuses uh, of government power and just massive wastes of money. And, uh, you know, we're more than a decade out from 9-11. Uh, we've killed Osama bin Laden. We have killed or detained uh, most of his deputies. So the real question becomes, who are we fighting against? This should be a dinner, table, a, a dinner table conversation. Every American should be asking, should we be spending billions of dollars on these things when people are out of work, when our infrastructure is failing, and when other economies like China are, you know, steaming ahead and we're falling behind, uh, is this really what we should be spending our money on, spying on our own people and buying ammunition to protect the government against our own people? It doesn't make sense. I think the Patriot Act should have been allowed to expire, and it's a huge mistake that Obama renewed it. So the fact that they spent hundreds of millions of dollars just to go after seven people that are in charge of a foreign website? As you said, this has been a very partisan Congress. They can't agree to do anything. And yet, uh, it seems like over the past few months, they've really been hell-bent on taking away Americans' rights. And I don't know why that is. The thing is, you also have to realize that it's all part of the bigger picture. It's all connected. The world around us has been manipulated, coerced in a direction where human life is outweighed by profit. Corporations and bankers now influence the policies, regulations, and even the decisions made by our own governments who have sold us down the river. They took our dreams, our futures. They took them from you, from all of us. And in their own arrogant, condescending fashion, they expect you to roll over and accept it. They pass into law further restrictions on your personal rights and freedoms. They want you to shut up, to keep quiet. Keep you alone and all of us divided. Marketing has you chasing an image, telling you what you need to do, what to think and say, how to feel, how to dress, how to be you. Who are you? Do you even know? Can you honestly tell me that you are happy with life as it is defined for you? Open your eyes, it's all out in front of you. Stop trusting these crooked politicians. They don't care about you. They don't care. The will of the people is not a profitable investment. All the while you chase the dream life they created for you, waving it in front of your face like a carrot on a stick. Stop it. Stop being guided through life. We need to quit letting the decisions of a few control the lives of the many. We need to take our future, our children's future, back into our hands. But it's clear that despite the number of people, growing number of people that have come out opposing these bills, 
the government is going to continue waging its own war without the support of the American people. And even if these bills don't pass, the only threat is the threat of ideas. So guess what, everybody? Say goodbye to that America that you once knew. Our government sucks. So we need to wake up and speak out about these practices before every shred of our privacy is gone. America, the greatest losses to our freedom have come not from someone attacking us, but from the government ignoring the Constitution and the majority letting them get away with it. Yeah, we torture. Yeah, we spy on you. Yeah, we do all of this, but it's no big deal. Get used to it. You know what? We're not going to get used to it. One day, somebody's going to have to make a stand. One day, somebody's going to have to say enough. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. But when the government fears the people, there is liberty. So what do you say? Maybe we should all just stop paying our taxes and revolt. Because this is bull****. It's time to wake up. First, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. The gift of freedom is yours by right. We must never let them take it from us. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! This battle is just getting started.